Hello again people, it's Jonathan, also known as the PC Genie, and now I'm going to be talking about the different types of armour and their considerations in terms of the sorts of things that you would tend to see throughout from the early to the late medieval period. Now of course I've got a personal collection but it's only just a few examples, there are plenty more to consider, but it'll give you food for thought anyway. Now for the whole video I'd like you to consider just three main things that will be involved with the sorts of armors I'm going to be looking at. First thing, obviously economy, so how much it's going to cost for your common man to your esteemed knight to your king. Secondly, weight, so of course how heavy your armor is, how tiring it's going to be to move in and how hot it might end up getting. And then thirdly, mobility, so whether you're going to be like a cardboard man where you can't really do anything at all, or whether you're basically going to be able to do anything like a normal man and do any kinds of movements at all that you like. Okay, so uh, and apart from that, of course, considerations between doing things like close combat or doing things like projectile combat, such as, of course, archery. Okay, so for our first armour, the Gamberson. Now, this is actually something I think they don't put enough in the movies. This is pretty much one of the cheapest kinds of armour you can get, and seen all the way right from sort of late Roman period and later, so it's really easy to make and also of course quite effective in battle. And this is basically, as they call an arming jack, gambeson, those sorts of things, but basically it's padded armour. And you'll see here you get different quilting and things like that, so you've got different layers, sort of here. In this case you've got different squares, sometimes diamond shaped or sometimes in strips, and in between them you'll have different layers of thick padding so then if something strikes you it's going to absorb the blow but also you tend to get tough outer materials like a sort of thick leather, canvas, linen, any of those kinds of things are going to absorb, they're going to stop the things like cuts and thrusts and things like that and then with the padding underneath to take the impact of it all. Now of course with certain weapons I mean it's got a fair bit of maneuverability I mean I can't go whole way in it is a bit restrictive, especially on the heavier models like this. But I mean, I can still do quite a lot of things. I mean, if I was an archer, I could knock an arrow, aim loose from there pretty easily. If I had something like a sword, I've still got plenty of movement to do plenty of fighting all around as I need to, and do whatever I need. So with something like this kind of gambeson, let's see, it's, it's nice and cheap. It's not that heavy, I mean, I could, you know, this is pretty much like a thicker version of clothing. Imagine like wearing a, a winter coat kind of around, so you might not take it to the desert, but I mean, in a temperate or cold region, you can pretty much go all day in this kind of thing and have a chat to your mates, or go into fighting. But of course, one of the disadvantages is, because it is like a thick coat, it can get a bit hot and sweaty on this. And it's not very breathable either because you've got the thick padding and things which stops it from breathing like you might do in a shirt or tunic or something. But let's see, I mean, it's not very heavy. It's really cheap and easy to make. I mean, you could get it from any tailor who made your tunic, get a bit of padding in there. I mean, all you need is two shirts, a bit of maybe matted wool or felt or something in between, and then to make sure it stays in place, sew it all together in quilting, done and dusted. Okay, so for our next armour we will be looking at mail armour, also known as chain mail armour, ring armour, all sorts of things. Uh, this version is called a Horburgeon, which basically is just half sleeves. You can get something called a Horburg, which is what you'd see on something like a, a medieval knight from the early medieval period, which would be full sleeves, and you'd even see them wearing a coif on their head, and what are called chaucers on the legs, head to toe in this sort of thing. For those of you who don't know about the term, I mean, when you hear chain mail, it's simply just obviously a chain in terms of like the usual kind of thing. And then mail is French for net. So of course it's really easy to get an idea of what it means because it's a chain net, which is just basically what this is. You've got something like a chain, except in a whole net. And these sorts of shirts are sort of, I'd say they'd start to go towards the opposite sort of style of the gamberson. So, I mean, it's very breathable, and that's why you even see them being used in times like the Crusades, rather than things like brigandine armour, splintered armour, 
cure bully as in boiled leather, those sorts of things. Because it's extremely breathable. I mean, obviously, there's the, you've got these different holes and perforations in it, which means it's completely freely breathing. And apart from the actual heat conduction from something like the sun or the atmosphere, you've got no sort of, you know, you're not boiling inside your own armour. And you can also wear other armour with it as well. It's a lovely sort of intermediary layer. So even people like later knights in plate armour also wore areas of mail armour, or even whole shirts of mail, underneath other armours and over other armours. And that's why, actually, it's one of the reasons why this is one of the longest serving armours in all of history, actually. In fact, I'd argue the longest serving armour in history. Seen right the way from the Roman period, in fact, they actually wore it for longer than their, uh, their sort of plate style armour that they're more famous for and goes right the way through pretty much, pretty much up until the Renaissance and gunpowder starting to take over. But I say a very long spanning armour and it's very usable. I say because it's got plenty of breathability. Apart from that it's got completely, whoops, got completely free manoeuvrability so I can do literally anything that I'd normally be able to do in a shirt or tunic or any other things like that. I can move around as I see fit. I can do all kinds of things. And you know, I can do star jumps or whatever, because this is a really flexible armour. And although it is heavy, in terms of you literally wearing a lot of steel on you, it's a very flexible kind of armour. So all the things and all the movements you can normally do, with things like if you're going to knock, draw and loose an arrow from your bow, if you're going to take your sword, you're going to window guard, guard a lady, boar's tooth, and you're going to do any parry strikes, all kinds of things all around, mail armour or chainmail armour is incredibly useful for it. You can do exactly the same movements as before. The only disadvantage is that because of the actual weight of metal, although it's good for deflecting things like, like slashes, sometimes a bit of padding against actual impacts to a degree, and even a slight bit of help against things like thrusts and piercing, it's obviously it's a bit of a heavy item, so I've noticed when I'm sparring that sometimes as you're doing any kind of lunge or sudden movements, it's almost like a sort of like having a sledgehammer or merry-go-round attached to you. It sort of pulls you about a bit. And it is one of the heavier kinds of armour, <coughs> even though, as I say, it is very flexible. So, let's see, I mean, pretty decent stuff and very long serving for good reason. In terms of economy, I mean, it did take a while to make, but by the time it was getting common enough, I mean, especially when you've got it handed down the generations and this stuff's easy to repair, so you just need to fix the loose rings and do that rather than making a whole brand new item if it gets damaged. This stuff became fairly common around most of medieval period to many cultures from east to west. And for my next and final armour, Brigandine. Now to certain people, especially gamers, might sort of initially first look at this and think studded leather. I'll tell you right off the bat, that's not the case. All of these dots and metal sort of studded type things you see here are all rivets holding inside different steel plates. So if you hear yes, that's all steel armour with various overlapping plates in what it tends to be called coda plates or sometimes brigandine. Slight variations between the two. And if you look, I mean if I stop to do this, you will see the plates actually start to show, which are as I say overlapping each other. So you've got pretty much full coverage with solid steel plates rather than with things like chainmail links. Now of course this, this would usually be worn actually over armour like gambesons and mail armour and things like that. It's sort of halfway between things medium like sort of mail armour to the heavier sorts of things like full steel plate you know armour like cuirasses and full entire plate harnesses. And usually you'd see I mean, you can see things like this, the torso, which you might see sometimes on its own, especially if people like archers, you've got enough space and maneuverability to do things like draw and loose arrows, and you can keep fighting on foot fairly effectively. But also, you do see things like a brigandine sort of sleeves, sort of forearm protectors, and that's when it starts to, like plate armour, start to come into sections and segments. So on something like a gambeson or male, they've got just basically an entire torso and sleeves, more than one item, you usually see different parts like the torso piece and then it'd be attached to your upper arm, maybe some cooters which are elbow guards 
and then some you know band braces made of the same kind of structure and material but just maybe some solid plate for things like the cooters and pulleys and things on the knees and whatnot or even uh, pauldrons for your shoulders as well sometimes but of course this is it's actually believe it or not lighter than my mail armor i've got at the moment so actually it's still fairly maneuverable i can do quite a bit in this and fight quite well but also i mean of course with something like these more solid plates you'll get less flexibility but i can still do a fair bit of moving around like i need to and again you can always compromise with something like brigandine top and then male sleeves or something like that so then you can carry on doing various other actions like you need to okay and uh well I'd say that's basically the armour I've got. I mean, there are plenty of other examples and plenty of other types of defences. As you can see, these are all very protective. <laughs> but yes, I say, I mean, you've got different ones between the East and the West. And uh, yeah, certainly worth sometimes, if you're doing anything like Hema, it's worth actually practicing and trying some of these armours out, especially if you're looking into armoured fighting. So then you're looking rather than just cutting your opponent up in normal places. You're looking at the special exposed weak spots. Although I'd recommend being careful when doing that, because if you're going too hard, you know, intentionally doing things like stabbing a neck and something like, you know, something like hema, you might end up doing quite a bit of real damage to your opponent. So always watch out for that and sometimes pull your strikes a bit, but keep to the good technique and speed. So yeah, tell me what you guys think of armor and the sorts of combinations you prefer most. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Have a good day, guys.